friends, Jerry Rosa here in the Rosa String Works Workshop with episode number two of Shop Talk. Episode one seemed to go over real well, got some good feedback, seemed like quite a few people did watch it. I hope you'll enjoy this one. We have a lot to get to this morning and we're going to get started. First thing I want to say is thank you to all my folks that are supporting me with Patreon. I really do appreciate it. At the very end of the videos, there is a little circle or box, I can't remember which. One of them takes you to Patreon. If you click on that, it'll you know take you right to where you need to be. Also, in the description of my videos, there is a link to support, which is the Patreon support. And I do appreciate that very much. YouTube, you know, I, I hate to say this this way because it sounds bad, but, you know, the greed thing is just, you know, runs rampant. And they were paying very well for a while, just about the time I finally get up to the point where I could receive some of that pay, they started cutting back. Well, they've cut back yet again. And, um, you know, all the uh, YouTube creators are crying about that. A lot of them have had their revenue cut in half. These videos are expensive to put out. Uh, you know, I'm paying uh, Melissa to put out these videos and of course Melissa's going to see me talking about her right now see <laughs> so you know the the point is it's a week's salary a lot of times to put out one video that's expensive even if you were paying minimum wage which we're not you know that's expensive to pay a full week's salary just to put out one video and you know I'm not saying that it, every week it takes a whole week to put out one video but some videos do take that long so my point is if you can help me out uh, either on Patreon, that would be appreciated. I don't want anybody to support me on Patreon if you're not financially able to do so. So don't feel bad if you know if you're barely getting your bills paid or whatever. I've been there my whole life. I know about that, and I'm not asking you to help me at all. I don't need that kind of help. Um, I you need to take care of yourself. But if you can, and you do have a little extra money in the pot, and you're able to help me out, then I appreciate it very much. Uh, there are a lot of expenses that you just wouldn't understand unless you do this. There's all kinds of computer expenses. There's all kinds of storage uh, expenses. There's, there's just expenses like you wouldn't believe. The point is, uh, you know, you could help me out if you can. And if you can't help me out financially, then you could help me out this way. And that is let the whole video play. Instead of just watching a minute or two of it, play the whole video. That helps a lot. Let the commercials play uh, if you can. Uh, you know, I know it's annoying, but if you can let them play, that helps us out. That helps our revenue, and we appreciate that. Enough said. Thank you very much, especially to my Patreon people. I really, really, really do appreciate your support. My t-shirt. I think this is the theme for the coronavirus. I was better, but I'm getting over it. <laughs> <laughs> I think the whole country was better and now we're over it. <laughs> you know, that's kind of the idea there. The uh, t-shirts, we have ordered a restocking of the t-shirts. Uh, I don't talk about them that often because this is a mom and a pop ground roots effort, you know, of uh, keeping the t-shirts in stock and doing it ourselves. We're not doing it online like a lot of the uh, channels do. We may change to that one of these days, but right now we're doing it all ourselves and we ship them from here and everything. So we don't always have a ton of t-shirts in stock, but we're getting more. They're making more as we speak. But uh, this is just one that's available from my website, rosastringworks.com. The for sale page has everything that we sell outside of the normal video stuff. Antler saddles, you've heard me talk about them many times and I'll probably even address them yet again through all these viewer questions and things. But I just wanted to say, I always need deer antler. Um, if you've got it laying around anywhere, uh, you know, tacked up to the, you know, the woodshed out back, wherever it is, and you, you don't need it, uh, Hey, box it up and send it to me. If it's got both sides, you know, like this, uh, you know, then just saw it right in half, right down through the skull plate. Don't even worry about, don't saw off each individual piece. That's, that's two cuts you have to make. Just make one cut right down through between the two, put them in a box, ship them here. Um, I sure would appreciate it very much. 
it, any amount that you can send me, it, the better. Now, I don't really need the tips and the mid, mid parts. The base is the part that I really need, which is also why I don't really want you cutting them off on the ends because a lot of times some of the very best material gets cut off. Just saw right down between the two of them put them in a box and ship them here, I would really, really thank you for that. That would be another way you could really help support the channel. Speaking of that and telling you that I don't really need all of the uh, tips and the mids, I have tons of that left over. Perhaps you can see down here, I have tons of tips and ends left over. If someone needs that and uh, you know I will ship it out to you approximately just under a pound um, free of charge I'll ship you pieces um, if you need them let me know that you need them because there's no point in that just laying around here I won't ever use all that in my whole lifetime now I do use a lot of the tips and the you know mids for nuts and guitar saddles because they're thinner but the most of the antler up above the base is really porous even the base is porous to some degree so but the outside edges are pretty solid and so for a guitar saddle which is thinner I can use a lot of that for the guitar saddles I can use a lot of the tips for mandolin nuts and even for guitar nuts as far as that goes but the point is I have more than I'll ever use and so if you need some of that and and I can help you out just let me know and I will ship it to you free of charge I have what I have so I could run out fairly quickly so uh, if we get a huge number of requests but anyway there you go um, and I'll ship it to you wherever you are in the world I don't care but it'll come US mail by the way so it's gonna be slow mail if you are out of country I may not ship you a full pound if you're out of country by the way because it does get expensive shipping it that way the uh, next thing I want to talk about is uh, my old buddy Jeff Bradshaw up in Selma Oregon <laughs> <laughs> he put out a cool video this morning. I'm going to put a link on the screen and I'm going to put a link in the description. That is if I remember to do it. I have a real problem with all that stuff. <laughs> Remembering to do it. But anyway, Jeff put out a uh, coronavirus video, <laughs> which is very humorous. He's a really talented singer, songwriter, uh, musician. Um, that's the one thing that people don't know about Jeff Bradshaw at ElderlyIron.com. We talk on the phone all the time and he has sent me a few songs. And my problem with Jeff's songs is I just haven't had the time to really learn them by heart. But they're very good songs, very well written. And I think you'll enjoy the new video that Jeff just put out on the coronavirus. This is the video you're looking for. It's called Hunkering Down in My Hammock by Jeff Bradshaw, ElderlyIron.com. You're going to enjoy that. Make it go viral, folks. It's a cool song, and I think you'll like it. Now we have to get to all of this stuff. You guys uh, seem to enjoy it. And a number of you made mention of the first shop talk in your letters and memos to me here. So we're just going to start where we start, and we'll end up where we end up. Okay, the very first one is from Gray Wolf Eternity Guitars. And this was a comment on the 384 RSW Pass Me Not video. The comment was, he sent a guitar top through a thickness sander, not realizing that it was actually sanding too much. I'm not quite sure I understand his statement because it says it was sanding too much. It's down to 2.37 and 1.99 millimeter. If it's going through a thickness sander, I would think it would be fairly even, but apparently not. Um, apparently it's maybe not sanding level, I'm not sure. But anyway, the 2.37 is probably even a hair thick. You know, you wanted roughly a hundred thousandths of an inch and roughly it's about 40 thousandths uh, of an inch to a millimeter. So two millimeters would be about uh, 80 thousandths, which would be a little thin. And that's kind of where he's at on the 1.99. You're at roughly two millimeters. So you're gonna be just a hair under 80 thousandths there. That's probably a hair too thin. Even that would probably work if you put maybe a, just a, another additional brace in there or something like that, a couple of braces maybe. You know, you could probably make it work. You're right on the edge of being too thin, that's for sure. What do I think is too thin? It's 
too open of a question to answer. He did ask that. What do I think is too thin for a guitar top? You know, 80,000 sure on the edge, I'll, I'll say that for darn sure. Getting much thinner than that, I would say you're way too thin. The problem is, the reason that it's difficult to answer the question, it depends on the kind of guitar, the kind of bracing, it depends on the kind of wood. Redwood, way too soft uh, for 80 thousandths, it ain't gonna work. You know, red spruce on the other hand, possibly would work, it's a much stiffer wood. You know, western cedar, probably too soft for that also. So it depends on the kind of wood, it depends on a lot of factors. It's, there's no black and white answer to any kind of question like that. I'm sorry I can't help you much more than that, Gray Wolf, but uh, good luck to you. Hope it works out for you. This next uh, set here is from Barry Snow. And Barry uh, ha has been inspired by my videos to work on instruments himself. And he has restored an upright bass based on some of my videos. This is kind of a before picture. And you can kind of see it's in pretty rough shape there. And here's, here's an after picture. And he did a nice job, it looks like. And there you go. So he did a good job. He's cleaning it up and making it look good. So Barry, thank you for watching my videos and congratulations on your restore there. Here's a note from Jim Ritchie. And he said, my grandfather's old fiddle. He said, I heard something sliding around inside and I look in there and uh, I see a rattlesnake rattle in there. <laughs> What's up with that? Well, the old timers did that a lot, believe it or not. I, I pick up lots of old fiddles and, I, and I'll shake them like this and I go, oh, you got a rattlesnake rattle in there. And people look at me like, how did you know that? <laughs> it's got a distinct sound. You can tell it almost instantly when you pick them up and move them. You can just tell it's a rattlesnake rattle in there. And uh, if you've done this as much as I have, that is. Anyway, uh, he asked me, should he take that out or leave it in? And, and the bottom line is, it's just an old wives' tale that it supposedly makes the instrument vibrate better and all this kind of thing. And to be honest, it's just a bunch of baloney. That's not true at all. But on the other hand, having said that, you know, the old timers, that was important to them. Uh, if this is a sentimental issue, if, you know, like he said, it was his grandfather's fiddle, I'd probably leave it in there, you know, uh, from the sentimental standpoint. If you were serious about playing it and you really want to play it and play it well, I'd probably take it out and just save it, <laughs> you know? That's an individual choice. But uh, it doesn't do anything for the sound of the instrument. If anything, it probably makes it sound worse because it's just something else in there to rattle around and vibrate. There you go, that's the story on the rattlesnake rattles inside of old fiddles. And it is really common, believe it or not. And I've even seen them in guitars, by the way. I've, I've seen them in, inside guitars too. Not as common, but I have seen it. Okay, the next email is from Don Lyon, and uh, it doesn't say where he's from either, I don't think. His question is really about setup. You know, he was wanting to send the instrument to me, and unfortunately I had to decline because I'm just way too backed up. You know, he just had some general questions about what are some general rules of thumb on setup. And I guess I'd say a few things. Um, the rule of thumb, if you're not talking about specific measurements, is you want to play Play it just as low as you can get it at the first fret without buzzing and you want to play it I know this is going to sound contrary to everybody you want to play it as high as you can stand to play it on the other end you know uh, and still play it cleanly now why do I say that as high as you can play it by having your strings a little higher back there at the bridge you're putting more tension on your top you're going to get more vibration into your top but I say as high as you can play it cleanly now that could be still fairly low action, but, but my point is you want it as high as you can still play it cleanly. In other words, don't just set it right down on your fretboard if you don't need it down there on your fretboard. You know what I'm saying? It's a rule of thumb, guys. That means just general concept ideas. The higher you can keep your bridge, generally speaking, then you want to go there if you can. And that really applies to a guitar. It really applies to everything. You know, you get a little more tension on your top by having your saddle or your bridge a little bit higher. 
you know, there are points of diminishing return. And if you get your bridge too high on a mandolin specifically, it will at some point, it will start to sound like you're playing in a barrel. The sound won't be bouncing off the back and coming right back out. It'll just be kind of rattling around in, inside the instrument. I haven't really heard that on a guitar too much, although you, you will hear it on arch top. Uh, guitars with the adjustable bridges where you can raise them up that you could hear it on that kind of an instrument but on uh, mandolins that is can be fairly common if you just get the bridge way too high and that can depend on your neck angle too so if your neck angle is really steep on a mandolin and you got your bridge really high you're not going to get your best sound you got to have that neck angle at the proper angle. How do I know what the proper angle is? I don't even know what the angle is to be perfectly honest with you. I built me a jig years ago um, that holds the instrument in that angle when I'm gluing the neck on. I will try at some future time to tell you what that angle is, but the problem with telling you the angle on a mandolin is you got an arch top. How do you decide what the angle is? I guess you would just go flat from your sides to your neck angle is the best I could come up with. Maybe down the road, I'll try to give you that angle. But right now, those are just general rules of thumb about setup on a mandolin. As low as you can get it at the nut without buzzing, as high as you can stand to play it on the other end and still play it cleanly, that's your best rule of thumb I can give you. In terms of people that really want hard numbers on that, roughly 50 thousandths of an inch at the 12th fret would be pretty good on a mandolin. On the first fret, roughly, 11, 12 thousandths, something in that range right there would be real good. The next email, Rich Roberts from St. Louis. He says he's got a Gibson A5 mandolin and it's missing the bridge. Any suggestions where I can look to find one to replace it? He knows you can make one or whatever, but he wants to try to find an original type thing. You know, honestly, guys, I don't have any magic bullets on any parts anywhere on any kind of instrument. I get those kinds of questions a lot. Do you know where I could find a tailpiece for XYZ? I don't. The honest truth is I just don't. When I need those parts, I do just like you guys do. I go to Google, I go to eBay, you know, I go to places like that and just start searching. And inevitably, you'll find them. You know, if you keep looking and looking and looking, you'll find it, it, it eventually or find something that's similar. You know, a lot of times when you're searching with a computer, I, you know, I know this from my technical background. A lot of times when you're searching with a computer, less is more. Don't put in too many words to try to find something specific. In other words, if you're looking for uh, a mandolin bridge, you know, if you put in A5 Gibson, you know, uh, you know, arch top uh, mandolin bridge, well, it, you know, it's just gonna confuse the issue. Just try mandolin and bridge, try, uh, you know, uh, adjustable bridge, you know, something like that, Sh shorten it down, get as few words in your search as you can often will help you more than putting in a lot of words. Now, if you're finding too many hits, then you put in some more words to narrow it down. You know, so that's kind of the, the theory on searching. It's kind of counterintuitive to some people, but truly that's the way computers work and that's the way you ought to think about your searches. Hope that helps you. We got Alan Dust. Uh, from uh, Havana, Florida. He says, I don't know if this is the correct way to recommend topics for your shop talk, but here goes. <laughs> I want to know more about the saw that Mr. Rosie uses to cut slots in the nut. And then he goes on and talks about, uh, you know, general setup and he's always trying different capos and he still has problems with, you know, buzzing and different things like that. So let's try to address that all that real quick. The saw that I use for cutting the slots in the nut is just simply a fret saw. I'm fairly sure I bought this off of Stu Mac years and years ago. The best I can offer you there, I didn't look it up. You could just go to stumac.com and um, you know search for fret saws and see if you can find one like this. This one has a replaceable uh, saw blade that you can just unscrew here and put a new blade in. I did put a new blade in this years ago Pretty sure I got that from Stumac as well. It's, I say that because I used to buy a lot of stuff from International Luthier Supply out of Oklahoma. I don't believe they're in business anymore. And uh, you know they were a great supply house. They were very much like Stumac, uh, even had more stuff in my opinion, except that 
they were just a mom and pop shop and I think they just, you know, got old and went out of business. I don't really know the whole story on that. But uh, anyway, I, I imagine I got it from Stumac. I'm not really sure. And as far as the kerf and all that, let's just check it real quick. Um, it's pretty thin. The blade itself, not the, not the kerf, but the blade itself is 19 thousandths of an inch. So that's just a hair under 20 there. The actual teeth measure at, believe it or not, the teeth measure narrower. I can't believe that. That's weird. I didn't expect that. Maybe that's because I've used it so much I've wore it down. The teeth are measuring at 18 thousandths. So this is cutting a very fine slot. You know, even 18 thousandths, some people say, well, that your string's only 11, you don't want to use an 18. Honestly, I'd far rather have a wider slot than a narrow slot. Anytime you have a string pinched in a slot, you got a problem. Every single time you have a problem. One, it'll cause some kind of issue. You're better off to have a slightly wider slot than your string than you are to have a really tight slot to your string. That's another rule of thumb. How much wider? I'm just talking slightly wider, you know, just so that the string doesn't pinch when you slide it through the groove. If you lay it in the groove and you can't move it through the groove, you got a problem. So anyway, that's what I use. Now I use it like a file, guys. On the really fine strings, yeah, I use it like a saw. Your number 13 string, I would use this like a saw. I just saw a very fine slot. You know, like your 52 or 56 string, then I, I spin it like this as I'm, I just use it like a file. And it works great. The thing about it is that it doesn't load up like a file does. A file will just load up and you're just constantly cleaning your file off and you know, it's just a pain in the neck. I get it close with this, then I use the nut files and the nut, nut files then are gauged to the different size strings. This is uh, my go-to tool anytime I'm cutting a brand new uh, first time slot. I always cut it with this first and then I take the nut files to it. So there you go, long-winded answer. Hopefully you got what you were looking for. I do get that question a lot about that saw, so that's the reason I wanted to address it. The other thing that he talked about was the, you know, he's bought a lot of capos. He's, he's spent money from $2 to $200 on capos and he can't find one that he likes. My first thought on that is it's not your capo it's your guitar. Fret leveling and recrowning and all that probably isn't perfect. Unless it's perfect, doesn't matter what you put on there, it ain't gonna work real well. You know, think about this, again, it's just a common sense thing. Think about this just from a, oh, I never thought about it like that kind of attitude. Think about this, and that is, keep in mind at your nut end, you've got 11 thousandths of an inch or more clearance at that first fret. Probably even 18 thousandths is kind of the standard on a guitar. So you got quite a bit of clearance at that first fret. When I say quite a bit, 18 thousandths is tiny, guys. It's not very big. But that's quite a bit compared to when you put your capo on at, say, the third fret or second fret. Instantly, that pulls that string right down above the next fret. I mean, it's like just right above it. And how many thousandths is that? Less than 10, I'll tell you that for sure. It's probably eight thousandths, something like that. Eight thousandths, guys, pull out one hair. That's about five thousandths right there. So my point is, unless those frets are perfectly level, you know, it doesn't take hardly anything to make a string buzz especially when you put a capo on. So more than likely, that's your problem, it's not your capo. I hope that helps. It's just a common sense thing when you think about it. This one is from Bill, and I'm sorry, Bill, I can't pronounce that last name correctly, I'm sure. Louvier, L-O-U-V-I-E-R-E. -E. So that's my best shot at it, Louvier. Bill says, I was looking for videos on bending maple binding. I came across your videos and I love watching your videos that you produce. I learned a lot about neck angles, saddle positioning, bridge placement, crack repair. I like your no nonsense approach for repairing and building stringed instruments. He was wondering about uh, me offering a kit, you know, for the instruments. And a kit is something I believe it or not, I actually have thought about. I've thought about making kits for mandolins and stuff, but wow, you know, I just, I've already got more than I can say grace over to be perfectly honest with you. If I had some really good help here in the shop uh, that could do that kind of work, 
I'd probably get into the kit thing, but at the moment, that's probably just never going to happen. Bill, thank you so much for the kind words and for watching my videos. I really appreciate it. A viewer friend, Kenneth Miller, sent me this arthritis cream. I've been trying it out. I've had a lot of other folks send me different arthritis creams and or rec make recommendations. I've tried most of them, and I gotta be perfectly honest with you, I don't see anything. I don't feel any relief whatsoever. Surprisingly, this one here is just menthol. That's all it says. I can't say that it's really helping. It's not hurting anything, that's for sure. You know, what you don't know about me on my arthritis is I believe my arthritis is pretty far advanced. I have not been to an arthritis doctor. I know that's probably stupid, but the truth is I haven't. I've read up a lot on it. You know, I have this problem with this uh, crazy reaction to most drugs, paradoxical reaction. I do not want to go take all these different arthritis drugs. I, you know, I've already got arthritis. I don't need all the other problems and side effects. And, you know, most of them cause strokes, heart attack, you know, cancer, da 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 da. I came upon meloxicam a couple of years ago. I tried that, and for whatever reason, that actually worked. I didn't know how well it was working until I quit using it. Oh my gosh. I'm not being dramatic. I'm, I promise you I'm not. I, I'm just telling you the straight up truth. If I wasn't on the Meloxicam, I guarantee you, you wouldn't be seeing any videos. I couldn't believe how bad the pain was when I quit taking the Meloxicam for about four days. The pain was screaming bad. I mean, I couldn't hardly move. I, I seriously believe in another week after that, if I hadn't taken it for another week, I'd be in a wheelchair and I wouldn't be able to walk. I mean, that's how bad the arthritis is. It's that bad. The arthritis now is overpowering the meloxicam and I, some days I can barely use this hand at all. So it's getting there, it's coming and there's not much I can do about it. I'm the kind of guy because of my weird genetic conditions, I'm usually the last one to go to the doctor to the last degree. It's just like when I had my back trouble, they said, you've got to get that operated on. You need to have it operated on. Well, I said, when I cannot walk, when I cannot move, I'll get it operated on. Until then, it ain't happening. And God blessed me with a cure. I hung up on one of those uh, inversion tables. I tried it like 20 times, didn't work. Finally hung up uh, with muscle relaxers. I took some muscle relaxers before I hung up there. Just like a light switch fixed my back. Haven't had any more problems in the last almost 20 years now. Had back problems my whole life prior to that. That's all I can tell you. And that's kind of the approach I'm taking on the arthritis. Until I absolutely have to go to do something more severe, I'm not going. And that time <laughs> might be getting closer than I hate to talk about. <laughs> Unfortunately. This next email is from Derek Brown. I just want to send a thank you from the UK. I found your YouTube videos a couple of months ago and I have been an avid watcher since. He says, I've been an avid woodworker for years, but I've never tried guitars. Your videos gave me the inspiration to try and I have now refurbished two guitars, one Ibanez Electric and one uh, Area Pro 2 Semi-Acoustic. Now they're both in uh, perfect condition. He has one question. There's a break on a guitar he's talking about. It's a jagged split just under the top of the fingerboard through the neck, only the neck holding it together. The description doesn't give me quite enough. I kind of, you know, I see cracks right along both sides of the fretboard a lot of the times. I think that's what he might be talking about. The problem is I don't have a picture on this one for, for one thing and the description's really not accurate enough, but he asks whether he should try to get glue down in there or whether he should do a scarf joint. Well, Again, I don't think I quite have enough information to answer it perfectly, but I guess the way I answer most of those, you know, generic type questions like that would be, I always try to do the easy thing first. You can always do the complicated thing second. So in other words, I would try to get glue in there if you think that's a possibility, and I would try to get it clamped where the glue joint is tight after you get the glue in there, and I would leave it for at least 24 hours. And by glue, I'm talking generally Tight Bond Original, some real good wood glue. 
I don't think I'd use CA glue on something like that unless the crack is tiny and that's the only thing that's going to get down in there. Uh, but if you can get the tight bond original in the crack, I would do that. Then I would find some way to tighten the, the crack up and leave it for 24 hours and more than likely you'll be good to go. But if that doesn't work and you need to go to the extreme of a scarf joint or something, then you can always do that second. So that's my generic answer, Derek. I hope that helps you. Thank you for watching my video. The next one is from uh, Charles Mullins. And oh my goodness, does he have a problem here? He says, uh, I had a table accident, which I think there's a word missing. I think he means table saw accident is what I think he means and I cut off my left index finger just behind the nail. Wow, Yee. Ah, ah. I can feel that. <laughs> I feel your pain, trust me. Uh, it's healed, but I can't use it to play. Do you have any suggestions on how to learn to play three fingers? I'm not sure whether we're talking guitar or mandolin here. I'm not gonna tell you for sure I could learn to play with three fingers on my mandolin, but I believe I could. And I believe I could do it okay. Partly because I use my little finger a lot more than most musicians do in playing. A lot of musicians do not use their little finger, especially for the noting part. They use it for chording and things like that, but they don't generally use it for picking lead. Uh, too much. I mean, I'm not saying they never use it. They just don't use it as a general rule of thumb. I do use my little finger a lot. I think I could probably learn to play with just those three fingers. It's a tough thing, man. Um, on the mandolin, he says he can't use the Nashville number system because he's only got the three fingers there going on. But on the mandolin, you can use the Nashville number system. Now you're gonna have an open string and you're gonna have to learn how to not hit that open string too much with just the three fingers, but it can be done. In my mandolin method, the way I teach mandolin, I, I start you off with two fingers, I tell you to add that third finger, and then finally the fourth finger on that chord that you have to make. So you can play with two fingers on a mandolin, three fingers on a mandolin, or whatever. So it is possible, uh, won't sound as good, you just have to learn how to, to emphasize the notes you're pressing rather than those open string notes. I'm sorry I don't have a better answer for that. I don't think anybody could give you a much better answer for that because you got an issue there that unfortunately is tough to get over. But uh, God bless you, Charles. I hope uh, you're able to use some of that information and I hope it helps. Good luck to you, man. Jeffrey Dye. He said, I was a previous customer of yours from Colorado. I hope you remember me. Well, yes, Jeff, I do actually, because uh, your last name, Die, I have a friend, Andy Die, and that's how I remembered you. Anyway, and Andy Die, by the way, is a very good bass player, played with a band called Midnight Flight. I just happened across the video where you fixed my Eastman mandolin. Man, that really knocked me out. So apparently he hadn't even seen the video where I fixed his instrument. Fantastic work, my friend, he said said, I remember you telling me about the, the phosphor bronze strings were too bright for this mandolin. And uh, so he tried some of the other GHS strings and he said, I was right, that th th they worked out better for him. And specifically what I'm referring to would be the GHS LS250s. The GHS LS250s are silk and steel uh, mandolin strings. They will tone your mandolin down considerably. You will notice a difference, especially of course on the bass strings because those, those are the ones that are wrapped with your silk and steel. So your G and your D strings specifically will have a, a deeper tone. The other two strings, they're steel, just like they would be in any other set. So they're not going to be as noticeable, but, but you will notice the, the tonal difference and it will bring the overall tone of your mandolin down to try the GHS LS250s. If you can't find them available out on the web, they are available on my website under the for sale page again. I want to make it clear, there's two different GHS strings on there that I believe, there may be more, but there's two for sure that are similar and I want to tell you about the difference. One of them is the LS250 and I think the other one is is the LBS 250 or LSB 250. It's one of the two and Melissa will probably put it on the screen here. But anyway, the, the B uh, means bronze. So it's, it's like a phosphor bronze and silk. And the other one is LS 250, which is the steel and silk. The silk and steel is the one that really brings the tone down. The bronze one has got a nice sound too. It doesn't bring the tone down, in my opinion, as much as the uh, silk and steel. 
So there you go. That's, that's what I'd recommend. So Jeff, uh, thank you very much for your note. I appreciate it. Jeff adds down here, says, um, if anyone says that your methods are unconventional or you do things differently than they do, well, you just point them in my direction and I'll tell them how great of a mandolin man you are. <laughs> You're uh, awesome and uh, that's all there is to say, he says. So thank you, Jeff. I really appreciate the kind words. Glad you like your mandolin. I'm glad it's working out for you. Okay, this next email is from Brent Clark and Brent starts off uh, in the typical wise guy fashion. <laughs> he says, I hope this email finds you in good health even if onions taste terrible and purple is the new black. <laughs> if you watch my videos, you know what he means. And that is that I have this taste thing and it's just terrible. Trust me, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. And uh, I am totally colorblind, so purple could be the new black. And it is the new black for me because every time I see it. As a matter of fact, just a funny story just recently. Uh, you know, Melissa comes every day and she parks her little car out front here. And, you know, me, because I don't care about colors, I didn't pay any attention to what color it was. And somebody was asking me, whose green car is that out there? Whose green car is that out there? I don't know what you're talking about. Because, <laughs> you know, I'm thinking it was a black car all this time and it turned out it was green. So there you go. That gives you an idea. It's not easy being me. Anyway, he said uh, the guitar he has has a zero fret and it's about an eighth inch away from the nut. And it's a really big zero fret and it keeps the strings at 60 thousandths above the next fret, or above the first fret, I guess you'd say. And he wanted to know a way to fix this and he had some ideas, but honestly, I'll just tell you right now, I am not a fan of the zero fret. In fact, this is the answer I gave him. It says, I'm not a fan of the zero frets. In the past, I've actually pulled the fret and I've actually sawed right down through that uh, zero fret slot. In other words, you know, so you're probably sawing off maybe that much of the end of your fretboard. And I just saw it straight off, move the nut right there, and that's where your new nut is. That's how I fix it, because I don't like them. And then I just put some little decorative strip in front of the nut, you know, to fill in that gap, because when you move your nut back, obviously you've left a, a blank area there. And that's what I do, clean it up that way and fix it that way. Now, a lot of people have all kinds of ideas and theories about how to intonate a guitar and change this and that by moving that nut around or filing the nut differently. I am not a fan of any of that. I am black and white, dyed in the wool believer that you don't mess with the nut. You leave your nut flat, straight. Everything is measured from that nut back and it's measured in thousands of inches. You start messing with that and you're messing with everything. Yeah, I know the theories about, you know, changing this a little bit, but you're screwing up a lot of things when you do it. I don't believe in intonating a guitar at the nut at all. I believe intonate the guitar at the saddle. I know other people on YouTube will disagree with me totally, and that's okay. I got no problem with that. I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm just telling you, I don't believe in it. Just move your nut where it's supposed to be in this case, you know, and don't mess with the rest of it. Just intonate it back there at your saddle and you'll be fine. And you'll be close enough for the girls I go out with. There you go. Um, and anyway, Brent, so thank you, my friend, for being a smart aleck. <laughs> I appreciate the comments, I really do. Um, the next fella here is David Kirby. David, he just wanted to send a couple of pictures of the first mandolin that he built, and he built it for his son who plays um, violin, and he built it uh, from the Roger Simonoff book and from watching my videos, he said. He said the mandolin is a little bit orange, but um, he said his that's his son's favorite color. Well, if that's your son's favorite color, that's the color I'd make it also. And that's a pretty mandolin. It's very nice looking. I hope I'm not shaking so bad that you can't see it. Let me try to steady my hand there. But that's a very pretty mandolin, some pretty wood in it. And uh, you did a nice job, David. Thank you for watching my videos. Thanks for sending the pictures. Here's an email from Art Ogle. And Art uh, was an old bluegrasser, uh, apparently. And uh, he has sent me a lot of emails over the years. And uh, we've talked quite a bit. But he had a problem with a guitar recently where the pick guard was coming off. 
and he asked what kind of glue to put under there to, you know, should you use CA glue and all those kinds of things. Well, again, I always believe, as I've said so many times, do the easy thing first. If it doesn't work, you can always do the harder thing, you know. So my thought was the easier thing is to try to heat it up. Take a hair dryer. Now you gotta be careful doing these things, guys. You know, I'm not telling you go out and heat something up and you know, if you create a problem, you're on your own. If you're careful, you can take a hair dryer, heat up that plastic. That plastic will in almost instantly start to get soft. The adhesive will uh, get sticky again and you may be able to press it down and clamp it back down and it may hold. Well, for art, it did work and uh, it is holding. So there you go. I would try the easy thing first. Uh, it's better to do that because see, once you get the glue under there, you've contaminated it. And if that glue doesn't hold, you're screwed. You know, it ain't gonna work, period. You're gonna have to take it all up and clean it all off and start over. So do the easy thing first, try the heat and see what happens. But be careful with the heat. The next email's from David Cole. He said, I just received my deer antler saddle. I installed it on my 12 year old Michael Kelly uh, Legacy Deluxe. And here's a picture of his Michael Kelly Legacy Deluxe there. And you can see the white saddle on there. It made a major improvement in volume and tone. Dale says, I watch all your videos. I've made many changes to my guitars and mandolins. And he just wants to thank me for putting these videos out. So Dale, I'm glad it worked for you. Glad you like that saddle. Thank you very much. The saddles are available on my website on the for sale page. Finally, we're at the end. And that's where the thunderous applause comes in. <laughs> This last email is from Tommy Baird, and he's from the Sunshine State. He was referring back to the prior shop talk where we talked about the open string making the funny noise. He had that problem, and he applied my methods, which are finding the problem at the nut or the saddle, because that's where the problem generally is when you have a open string making a weird sound. The nut angle is wrong or the saddle angle is wrong. Basically, you just want a long straight angle and the end point there is the last place the string touches. And as long as that's the last place the string touches, you're good. As I mentioned before, if that string comes off your nut like this, and there's still more nut here, it will vibrate in this area. You want the string coming off of that tip edge of that nut and the tip edge of that saddle. And if you get it like that, you won't have any problems with those weird sounds. So Tommy Baird, I'm glad that that tip helped you. I hope it helps some more folks. Well, thank you very much for sitting through this. I hope uh, you learned something. I hope you heard something there that will help you as well. Uh, God bless y'all and we'll see you on the next Shop Talk. Yeah.